Jägermeister Porsche, uh, 962, um, 1989. It's um, a full water-cooled Porsche engine, twin turbos, six-cylinder, five-speed gearbox. Now, I understand you drove this for the first time this morning, came from the back of the grid, finished second, so clearly you're, uh, you're very comfortable in it already. Uh, I've been very fortunate over the last 10 years. I've driven a lot of identical Porsches. Uh, there's 956s and 962s. So I've driven a fair few of those over the last 10 years. They were iconic cars of the Group C era. Um, and obviously incredibly successful. I mean, what's the secret of their success? I mean, what do they like to drive? They're very simple and very comfortable and easy to drive. It's, it's um, a full synchro mesh gearbox, the power comes on smoothly. Um, it's a very comfortable and easy car to drive. It's a full credit to the factory to make such a user-friendly car. So this is a, a lot different from some of the other Porsche we've seen, different aerodynamics, a lot more carbon fibre in this one. Do you feel that behind the wheel? Yeah, this, this is one of the best Porsches I've driven. A as it goes through the years, there's more and more um, carbon fibre and Kevlar. The, the chassis has all the weight distributed differently. There's six different versions of engines that took place over the over the period of time. So they're all a little bit different than each other. This, this is one of the better ones I've ever driven. Well, you did so well this morning, came up and finished second uh, overall. What do you think is capable of around here? What's ultimately, what's he comfortable with? Or what sort of lap times? I, I, I truly don't even know. I, did, I didn't even see the lap times. I, I haven't even looked at the lap times. I, I, I got stuck a little bit in behind George. George has got a beautiful car. There's a little bit of stick there. George was doing a good job blocking and um, he had a lot of power down the straight and just bottled it, necked us up a little bit. I, I don't know what it'll do by itself on a clear bit of bitumen. So what are the plans for this car now that it's here in Australia? It's going to stay in Australia for 12 months. It might do a couple of selected events and then it'll be off to the States in 2016. We had a bit set, a couple setbacks. Uh, we had a container all loaded up with six cars to come here, you know, which we planned to do. And, um, you know, find out at the last minute that we had a, a, a strike at the port. And, uh, you know, boats were in line to, to be unloaded so that we could, like, put a container in there. And then all of a sudden, from, you know, having one date uh, was cancelled and a second date was cancelled for our cars to be shipped, uh, put us in a really tough spot where we had to unload the containers and, and figure out an alternative way to have them down here, which at the last minute we decided to airship the, the, the three cars instead of the six cars. And at the same time that caused us a bit of a problem because we couldn't bring all of our tools and equipment and, and so <laughs> it was a bit of a well, situation here. Yeah. Has the effort been worth it? Are you enjoying your time here? Oh, absolutely. I love this track. Phillip Island, I think, is one of the greatest track that we've been at, you know, there's several in the state that we we attend every year, and this is one that we want to, in Australia, attend every year as well, and, you know, we enjoy it very much. This is fabulous. You mentioned you brought three cars out here. We have a couple of marches. What are the cars that you have brought out here? We brought a Sabra, which is a, 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 a rear lion built for the uh, Israeli market car, a sports car that was built in the early 60s, and a friend of mine owns it, uh, Jacob Shalit decided to come here, a very great car to drive, he's a great driver, and obviously a two, two liter March 73S, which, you know, we enjoy very much driving it. So they were the cars that made the, uh, the, made the ballot, what, uh, what was left behind that was going to come here, what have we missed out on? We, we were going to bring an additional Sabra, which was a coupe, and the two other ones were uh, specials, American specials, one of them was a Curtis. Uh, KK500, uh, really, I think that car I had here last year. And the other one is a Thompson Typhoon, oh, right. which are a fabulous car. We had them all ready to come. And unfortunately, very big cars wouldn't quite make it in the plane, you know, the right way. So they were left behind. So you said that you like coming out here whenever possible, every year if possible. I mean, are we going to see perhaps those cars next year or? We tend to, yeah. We wanna, we're actually going to do it a little bit different next year. 
we're going to try to organize this this meet here a little bit early on so that we won't have any more uh, hold up with the you know shipping and 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 we might we might even leave the cars here to do you know two or three races so that we can you know have a little bit more fun and expose the car a little bit more for the public to see and enjoy well they're beautiful cars thank you for going to the going to the expense and the effort to bring them out here um, i hope you're in hope you're enjoying your weekend hope it's a good weekend for you and for now thanks for joining us in pit lane thank you this is absolutely phenomenal even though the rain and the weather and all the aggravation we went through i wouldn't want to change that for the world this is it <laughs> It was built in 1975 by a dealer team Vauxhall to compete in the Super Saloon Championship uh, with the late Jerry Marshall contracted to, to drive the car. And in the first season in 75, it was all conquering, won everything. 76, I think he'd had a bit of a tricky start, but won the season, the championship again. And then in 77, uh, dealer team Vauxhall withdrew the support and they did two or three races, but um, uh, that was all they had the budget for. The Super Saloons, are the closest thing we'd have in Australia are the, the sports sedans. Uh, today the sports sedans here are very much tube frame chassis with a replica body over the top of them. Uh, how much of the original Vauxhall is actually in Baby Bertha, if any at all? Oh, all the centre section is Vauxhall Forenza. Um, so if you look behind me, uh, certainly if you get it in profile, uh, from the A pillar to the, what would it be, C pillar, is all basically original shell and then they put a Didion rear end on it and uh, and then all the front is space framed with the engine moved right back um, and inboard uh, front suspension rocker suspension designed by Frank Costin. So what about the uh, the power plant? Originally it had a Repco 5 litre engine in it about 490 horse I think um, fuel injected um, Jerry never really understood that because they were not as strong an engine as the Chevrolet in that period um, but he thought it was probably a political situation. Um, when he'd had the um, Repco removed, I don't know, long before my time, uh, and it's now got a Chevrolet uh, 5.7 V8 in it, uh, uh, breathing on four Webers. Originally the Repco had a, was fuel injected. So uh, what's it like to, uh, to drive around Phillip Island? Well, Phillip Island's a lovely circuit, as I'm finding out, though I don't like your weather. Uh, today, hopefully, uh, things are better. Um, it, it's, it's heavy, it's very heavy on the steering. And there are some these tight corners that go on, on and on and on. They, you really have to hang on to it. Um, but uh, my, my favourite corner is Hayshed Corner, because you can, it's a lovely, fast-flowing corner, and it just, just drifts a little bit through there short change into top and, and then nail it, and it's beautiful. So do you have any other cars in your collection at home? 
I've got a Chevron B8, um, which is a lovely car which my son usually races. I've got a TBR, 1965 TBR Grand Tourer Mark III, which I race in endurance races with a, with a good friend of mine. And uh, I've got a big block Chevrolet Corvette, 1965, which is for sale if anybody's interested. Well, I've been um, hassling Dad that he's crazy to drive it over the last few years and uh, got conned into having a steer this weekend, but I've really wanted to have a drive ever since he's had it. I've just waited for uh, him to go through all the pain and all the race weekends where it's broken down and we've made sure it's in perfect condition and running fantastic before I've been lucky enough to hop in, but it's definitely been a big thrill. From a power to weight ratio point of view, it's the fastest car I've, different, uh, I've driven and uh, it's, you know, it feels like you're being shot out of a cannon. From between MG and Siberia, you're, uh, before you've had a chance to blink, you're, you're turning into Siberia, so it's been a lot of fun. And now we're coming up to the last race of the day and I'm starting to feel confident and comfortable in the car. So how long has it been since you've driven an open wheeler? Probably about as long, probably about the same time I spoke to you last, about uh, 1999 when I was racing Formula Ford, so had a roof over my head since then. What do you prefer? <laughs> I prefer the security of a modern V8 supercar because you know if something happens and you have an accident you're very safe. Obviously um, if you walk away from an accident in one of these things you've had a good day so definitely uh, respecting the car and the conditions and, and uh, the safety factor this weekend and looking after dad's baby uh, but having driving it like it should be driven as well and uh, trying, to, trying to set some set the lap times that the car probably deserves. Well, as you say, in terms of power, it's like, you know, it's, it's not quite probably not as powerful as a V8 supercar, but <coughs> certainly power to weight ratio, the yep. aerodynamics and all the yep. rest of it. How different is it to drive? Well, you can't compare them, but it's a much faster car. I mean, the power to, I don't know the exact weight, but it has around 580 horsepower, and the weight would be similar to that in kilograms. So the power to weight ratio is immense and um, you know, a lot more, I mean, big, fat, sticky tyres, unlike the V8 supercars, a lot more downforce. So from a lap time perspective, it's a good three or four seconds quicker than a V8 supercar around here. And that's driving it gently. You know. So what about for the rest of the year? You're driving with Erebus with your Will, uh, brother Will again in the uh, Endurance Championship. What yep. about uh, any other drives for the year? Uh, well, yeah, I don't, not racing anything full time, not racing in any series full time at the moment, unfortunately, not through um, lack of wanting to, but um, yeah, driving with Will in uh, Sandown Bathurst and the Gold Coast 600 with Erebus, which uh, we're looking forward to again. We had a, you know, it was fantastic sharing a car together last year, and um, it was definitely, from a working relationship point of view, it was easy just to, to slip into that slip into that role as we obviously know each other really well and we had a lot of fun. We didn't have the success we wanted but had a lot of fun working together so looking forward to um, doing that again and hope, hopefully having a slightly better run. That you know. uh, endurance series seems to have been quite a success. Would you like to see that expanded at all? Perhaps a couple of other extra races thrown in there? Well, for someone like me who's not racing V8s full time at the moment that would be fantastic. I'm not sure if it's on the cards. I don't know if it's really uh, yeah, don't know if it's going to happen or not. I haven't heard any word of it, but that'd be great. The more racing I can do, the better. And uh, I'm always hustling and scrounging for any drive I can get my hands on, so. Because you made your name in Porsches, of course, uh, not just here, but overseas as well. Any, um, <coughs> have you looked at going back to the Carrera Cup or perhaps doing some overseas stuff? I've definitely looked, um, but just, it is difficult to to put a budget and put a deal together even to run in Carrera Cup at the moment. Not many of the teams are sort of fully funded and employing a driver, so, so to speak. So yeah, unfortunately, we haven't been able to put a program, a full-time program together this year, but we're always always working hard to, to try and put some sponsorship together and, and do some more racing than I'm currently doing. The Shannons Nationals recently kicked off their 10th season at Sandown. The Nationals are sort of a halfway house, somewhere in the twilight zone between the top professional level of the V8 supercar circus and the various state championships. 
The quality and quantity of cars in the series can be a touch inconsistent, but when everything's running, there's certainly no shortage of variety. Rob Kirkpatrick is the man in charge of the Nationals, and we caught up with him at Sandown to ask him about the series and where it sits in the local motorsport landscape. The original concept was to create a place to race and a national basis for those that wanted to, and there had been a few failures before this particular business model, and uh, this was set up on a very much a user pays basis, so each category pays a fixed fee so that you know that it's all going to work financially. Um, we knew that we're never going to get 40,000 people in the grandstand. Um, it is it is an alternative to the main game, um, but it's, it's providing a place to race, uh, and it's, 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 it's really that simple. Um, but of course it's on a, on a national basis, so the costs are higher, and you've got to travel the country, and you've got all those expenses, so it's not cheap necessarily, um, but it's, uh, it's providing a, a platform that seems to work. You mentioned the crowd there. I mean, it's, it's interesting if you have a look out in the crowd today. I mean, it is Saturday, albeit, but the grandstand is pretty empty. I imagine you wouldn't be expecting a huge improvement on, oh, on tomorrow. We'll get a few more tomorrow, but if we look across the Red Hill, there's probably more than there were last year. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of... It, it's, we made a decision three or four years ago to, to concentrate on the electronic media as well. So, you know, we have a, we have good TV ratings. We have uh, we, we send it out live streaming um, you know, to the fans. So getting people to come along to a racetrack is not as easy as it used to be. There's so many other things to do. People are very interested in what we do. It's a little bit like the AFL and the VFL. You know, we're the VFL. You know, the footy's just as good, uh, but you don't get the crowds. You mentioned the the streaming. And what does the streaming do? I mean, it's an interesting it's an interesting model and. Uh, some people are trying to sort of yeah, geo-restrict it or put it out there. You just put it out there in general, and that seems to be the way to get a lot of people. Well, do you know what sort of figures are, are, and what sort of viewership you have of, uh, online? I mean, yeah, sure. I mean, depending on the round, it's somewhere between seven and 20,000 people um, going on and off. Um, it's, it's uh, I mean, TV is getting up towards three, 400,000 people, so it's still the, the premium um, package, but it is growing all the time. Um, it's, it's, it's still relatively new, live streaming, so we make it free, available to everyone. We don't have a problem. We're not, we, don't, we don't have gates to protect necessarily. You know, the, the diehards will come along to the racetrack, and that's, it's, it's gradually picking up, but certainly the, uh, the live stream is picking up quite rapidly. With the categories, so the categories have to pay, I mean, is that the only criteria in terms of, how the, of who gets invited? Because if you have a look at some of the some of the fields in some of the categories, very small fields. I mean, we've had years and years of the Australian Formula 3 Championship. You know, our premier Australian Drivers' Championship fields, I think we've got about seven or eight cars this weekend. It doesn't seem to improve at all. Is there a point where you've got to say, look, this just isn't viable anymore? Is it just as long as they keep paying... You're welcome to race. To a degree. I mean, it's something like, I mean, they're, they're a fantastic race car um, and they're, they're welcome. You know, they, and they pay their bills and, and they've never been probably any more than 14 cars and any less than eight cars for a decade. And that's the way it is. Um, but I think that's a CAMS decision. You know, they've got to work that out with CAMS. Over the course of the, the year, you, you, as you say, the travel is, is one of the big big problems. Mm. Does that sort of limit the, the scope of things? I mean, would it help if you had more rounds in Melbourne or more rounds in Sydney and concentrated just on those two states? Or is it necessary that you do travel to places like Queensland? And well, you've, you've cancelled the round at Malala no. this year. Well, we've, got to, we've got to get the balance, and that's a good question. We've got to get the balance. We used to go to Tasmania, but the cost was prohibitive. Um, let's just go back a step and say that, say, for example, 50% of our participants, money's not a problem. You know, that's their... their individuals. Um, the other 50% are, you know, they're okay, but they can't, not, it's not money to throw around. So, But we need both. So we need the, the let's call them battlers, uh, for want of a better word, um, who, uh, we need them to, to hold the thing together, um, but they can't afford to go to extremes like Tasmania. To take a, a, a semi-trailer to, or a transporter to Tasmania is seven or eight thousand dollars. Now, it's okay if you can put, you know, six six Formula 3 in, but you can't put one sports in there. So it's it's just limited by cost. Um, Malala was an, an event with struggle. Um, we don't, funnily enough, we don't get a lot of support out of South Australia. We get, I mean, certainly Porsche does, uh, but, you know, we've had uh, the old saloon cars go there and get one local. Um, you know, sports events, I go to get no locals. 
so why are they going there? And it got to the point where sports sedans opted to do a V8 supercar around at Winton instead of going to Malala. Well, that sort of made Malala unviable where we've been struggling. Um, but I think with, with a new track at Malala, it's a new track in South Australia, that'll be a different story, but that's, that's for another day to talk about. But um, cost is a real issue, I and mean, it's $2,000 worth of diesel um, to travel from Queensland to Phillip Island. Uh, and that can be an issue. It's, it's interesting, uh, sports sedans, for example, would prefer to go to Wakefield Park this particular year than Phillip Island. You say, why? It's a day's diesel closer. Yeah. <laughs> Does it disappoint you at all that you know, a category like uh, Kerrick Sports Sedans, I mean, you've, they've been one of your major categories. The Australian GT is another one that, you know, they, they're sort of, you know, the prettiest girl in the room has given them a wink and they've said, you know, goodbye, guys, mm. even if it's only in the case of the Kerrick for one round. But mm. um, would it help if you were you know, a bit more loyal? From the from the from the from the categories. Yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah, probably. It's, uh, but you know, it's their it's their it's it's their sport. It's their fun. It's their money. Um, but I think it's also up to up to up to us to make sure the categories are attractive. The major shake-up in Australian open wheel racing is the new Cam's Formula Four. Um, I was personally surprised that there weren't at least some rounds of Formula Four um, as part of the Shannon's series. Does that disappoint you at all that they've gone? They put all their eggs in one basket, and it's a pretty expensive basket. It is. Uh, disappointment, uh, probably a little surprised. Um, yeah, it was discussed. Um, but, um, yeah, yeah, probably should have done a few. And it certainly kept some costs down. But, uh, I mean, that's their, their baby. Um, but um, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. I mean, I think Formula Ford has dropped a few cars because of it. Formula 3 has definitely dropped a few cars because of it. So... You know, we, we've got a lot of open wheel racing with not a lot of seats filled. <laughs> so it's going to be interesting. So, ten years of the Shannon's Nationals. Um, what are the what are the plans? Do you have a, a long term view? Is there a marketing plan or a, a strategy plan for the next five years or so? That's being looked at at the moment. We. Every two or three years, we look at reinventing ourselves, um, and sometimes it's major change, sometimes it's not. Um, other times, that we're sort of market forces drive us toward things like uh, endurance racing, and, and that's something to look at in the future. You know, how much endurance racing we put into the program? It certainly has an effect on the program. Do we run eight rounds, nine rounds? Um, do we perhaps run more like the Phillip Island rounds, where you know it's, it's all endurance? Do we do a similar thing somewhere else? Um, we, we're looking at it at the moment, we, we always need to, to be looking at progressing. Um, we're reasonably happy with the way it works, but you, you can't sit around and say, well, let, let's do this for the next 20 years. Motorsport's changing all the time, and we've got to change with it, and we've got to provide a place to race. It's as simple as that. And there's, um, there, are, there are limited opportunities to race on a national basis, and uh, we have the responsibility of providing it um, for other than the main game, and we'll continue to do that. But we've, we've spent probably half of today <laughs> talking to people and saying, what do you want to do in the future? And we've got to keep, keep looking forward. Well, congratulations on 10 years. Uh, can, yeah. Let's uh, hope we're back in another 10 years. I mean, you, let's hope you're back in another 10 years. Hopefully, by that time, I'll <laughs> give this up that. well and truly. <laughs> but <laughs> no, but for either of us, uh, congratulations okay, on it. And thank thanks for joining thank us you. in Pit Lane. Okay. Thank you, Rick.